Um, this event is on the second day of the International Open Access Week. And my name is Tom Mostert. I am the community manager for the Awaken Foundation and one of the coordinators of the Open Access Books Network, together with my colleague uh, Lucy Barnes, uh, who is here today on the panel, and Agata Morta. And before we begin, I'd like to mention that this webinar will be recorded and shared via our YouTube channel afterwards as well. Um, and as you may know, each year, the Open Access Week has a particular theme, which for this year is open for climate justice. And today we'll hear more from our four panelists on how we can lower barriers to climate research. You're all welcome to ask your questions via the chat or uh, to unmute after the presentations and to enter any questions during your presentations. And then we'll make sure to pick up on these towards the Q&A part of the session. So let me begin with introducing our four panelists who are here with us today. Um, we're joined by David Collins, who is professor of English at Bowdoin College. He is the author of the open access book, Stolen Future, Broken Present, The Human Significance of Climate Change, which we'll hear more about today. Then next to David, we have Esther Kovac, who is a lecturer in environment, politics, and society and the editor of the book, Politics and the Environment in Eastern Europe. And thirdly, we have Lucy Barnes, editor and outreach coordinator at Open Book Publishers, and also a fellow coordinator of the OE Books Network. Then our fourth panelist is Melissa Hagemann, who is senior program officer at Open Society Foundations and steering committee member for the Open Climate Campaign, which we'll also hear more about shortly. Then, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to David to hear more from our first panelist. So please, David, uh, take it away. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm really happy to participate in this session, since this is an area that I feel passionate about. Um, so let me just jump right in, uh, in the interest of time. I am someone who normally specializes in British Romantic literature. So I study aspects of European and Western cultural history. Um, and my, my work has led me to invest a great deal of emotional energy in the history of the West, roughly from the early periods of classical antiquity up to the present, and that long cultural narrative uh, in which we are all embedded to some extent. Um, and as the climate emergency continued to unfold, I became increasingly annoyed that people hadn't addressed its implications for that broader trajectory, that longer narrative in which we participate. My sense that was that we need to talk about the fact that if our future is beginning to disappear, then that broader history and its future disappears, and thus our own the context for our own activities is in danger. So I was interested in discussing the strange kind of relationship to time that emerges from that fact. <clears throat> um, so the two elements of my title emerge from that focus, stolen future, broken present. For me, the interesting, one of the most interesting things about the climate crisis that we don't address very often is that the fact we're pumping certain types of pollutants into the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, which will stay in the atmosphere for at least a century, according to scientists, means that even if we do eventually take action to reduce our imprint on the planet, the consequences of our actions today will drastically limit the effectiveness of those future actions so that in effect, we will remove the opportunity for a transformative effect of our actions to some extent by continuing to behave the way we are today. We have a stolen future. What does that mean for our present? It means that we continue to do our activities today as we often, always do. We are still invested in our life narratives and our cultural narratives, our political narratives. And yet at the same time, they cease to be valid they are undercut by the disappearance of that future. So we are in a broken present. We are simultaneously living one way and another way. Um, there's an incoherence in our very present moment. 
this sort of a perspective on time, of course, emerges only when we care broadly about our futures and the effects of the future on our present moment. We have to look around, we have to think broadly, and we have to think beyond a technical and policy perspective, and think about the emotions and about forms of, of a long-term interest and care about our shared lives. And I also wanted to think about the implications of those transformations. What do we do for an ethics? How do we sustain participation in the public sphere? How do we relate to each other? What happens to uh, the forms of attention we give to each other in such a broken present? It's a very difficult question. Um, also, what concrete actions can we take? Uh, always, it comes back to some of those concerns for many of us. Obviously, politically speaking, it's uh, we need to bring about massive transformation immediately. This is something that most climate change discussions include. Um, and then there's also the broad sense, where are we cosmically? What is our relationship to ultimate questions, religious, mythological, etc.? So the ramifications of our dilemma, I thought, were very large and could best be addressed by someone in the humanities. And since no one was doing that, I decided to jump in, uh, interrupt my work as a scholar of my field, and address these big concerns for the general public, as well as for my scholarly community. Um, so in 2011, I wrote a book, and it was published in 2014 at Open Humanities Press, which is an open access publisher. Uh, with a critical climate change series. And I was very welcome to be able to do that. Um, before I jump into the open access dimensions, let me say some of the aspects of that book that have continued to be distinctive, even after this roughly decade since the time it was published. There are several things that happen in the book that are not, broadly speaking, part of our public discussion of climate change. One is <clears throat> the centrality of tipping points, the possibility that we will cross tipping points soon um, so that there will be feedback loops. For example, if the Arctic ice melts, then there will be a runaway heating of the Arctic that will greatly drown out the positive effects of human actions to cut back on our carbon footprint. Uh, one key thing as well is the physical imprint of green technology. For example, today we have a big move towards electronic vehicles. In order to power them with battery technology, we will have to mine uh, the rare earth minerals to supply those batteries, which will create a massive environmental impact in certain parts of the, of the land mass of the, of the earth. Um, another is that we often think there's a technological impasse that limits our action, but it's really a political impasse in the United States and other nations around the world. Um, if we could reach a true political consensus to take action, uh, the rest of it would be much more straightforward. So all of these things also take place under the notion that I emphasize in the book that time's up. Um, 350.org, for example, still advocates for a reduction of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to 350 whereas we're up around 410 or 420. Scientists show that we cannot reduce that amount. It's there semi-permanently in the atmosphere. So whatever actions we've taken will remain there in the atmosphere and will truly profoundly shape our future. Um, so, uh, and we also will have a warming of the planet that will not cool back for a, roughly a millennium. So many of the premises of our public debate, I think are misleading. Uh, we need a somewhat sharper sense of the crisis. So those things remain distinctive. And one of the results is that at the time I wrote the book, almost every treatment of this discussion had to end in a positive note. Look how this is an opportunity to make a political breakthrough. Look how we can all gather and do this or that or the other thing. And I think that the, the, the genre as a whole of writing about climate tended to be Pollyanna-ish in the final chapter of dozens of books. And I thought it was time to break the taboo and abandon that premise and instead stick with the fundamental reality that there is a diminishing possibility that we will in fact act in time and to face the implications of that. Uh, that again is relatively unusual even to this day, way into the climate crisis. Uh, we just don't wanna face the difficulty of this 
situation. Um, excuse me for a moment. So some of the things that followed from that, again, the ethics, what kind of ethics should we share? So I discussed an ethics of the impossible or the ethics of defeat, the ethics in which we share a situation of fragility and failure and care for each other when we're wounded or lost. Not an ethics of possible victory, but the opposite. Um, and out of that, I suggested a couple of steps. Um, don't have children. Uh, a lot of my colleagues who went to the book and read it online, that was the first chapter they read, and they were scandalized by it. I found that interesting. Another is to stop flying, right? Things that are seldom mentioned in the public sphere, but are um, statistically and scientifically profoundly urgent for us to do. Still distinctive. It's interesting after a decade that these are still unusual positions. So moving to the open access part of it in my last few minutes here, um, I wrote the book so it would be accessible to the general public, even though it comes from scholarly concerns and from research in the science. I wanted it to be a blend of all the audiences I could imagine. And so clearly open access is fabulous for that purpose. And it has in fact reached a broad uh, public. Uh, luckily, I teach at a, a liberal arts college that has a library with a digital commons that created a link to the open access humanity site for the book, which is free for the public. And it gives me a report about the places in the on the globe where people sign in and get access to the book. So I can see, for example, that someone in Samoa has read the book or that someone in rural China has read the book. So I have a sense of a truly global reach thanks to the internet and thanks to the fact that English is a lingua franca. Um, it's being read internationally, which is really stunning. And it's very difficult to do with a traditional scholarly book. I've also received responses from readers around the world in various ways, from fellow academics, certainly, from uh, a kindergarten teacher in Berkeley who wrote with a list of questions for me, um, from technically oriented people in Europe who wanted to see an update about flying by air on, and its carbon footprint, um, and people who are writing back with specific questions about their ethical decisions. So it's led to a dialogue I've had with people in many different countries in many different ways. It's a multiply layered audience. Um, open access has made that possible in a, a truly stunning way. So I will just conclude with a comment that the urgency of the crisis, um, the need for people of every profession who have interest in this field to reach out and engage with the public in all of its different uh, modes is overwhelming. So I think that there is very little way to do this better than through open access publishing. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, that's very interesting. And also to hear um, about your research, the humanities take on some of these very big challenges and questions that, although the book was published in 2014, are extremely relevant maybe even more relevant uh, to consider still today. Um, if anyone has any questions for David, please feel free to enter them in the chat as we continue. Um, and then I will hand over to Esther and share my screen. Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me okay? Um, thanks for sharing the screen. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for inviting me uh, to share some of my thoughts today. My kind of contribution and route to open access publishing has been a little bit different um, to David's in the sense that we published our book almost two years ago now um, and very deliberately with OBP. And it was very much a collective decision um, along with my chapter contributors um, and co-authors. So we published a book almost two years ago on the politics and the environment in Eastern Europe. And what we were really trying to do with this book was to actually start a conversation that we don't feel is taking place very well, if at all, regionally. Um, and 
beyond. So I don't mean to say that uh, Eastern Europe is having a different type or an absent conversation around environmentalism and climate change to in the West. Um, it just has a very different political character and it grapples with very different environmental problems that are often under-recognized when we're talking about climate change policy and our options. Um, and so when we started thinking about this book, the motivation for it was to really actually to highlight um, the ways in which there is an endemic environmentalism in the Eastern European region, which has been swamped by a lot of the European Union expectations um, around environmental politics and conservation and environmental management laws and regulations. And in many ways, that's caused a bit of an environmental crisis because it has given an excuse, I would say, to many Eastern European governments uh, to not support the environmental sector because it's seen as a political enemy. It's seen as something that is financed um, by foreign interests, whether that be Western institutions uh, or corporations or NGOs. And so there have been quite strong clampdowns, whether we're talking about Hungary or Poland, um, in terms of the government trying to limit the development of civil society um, in the environmental sector or um, uh, amongst refugee activities or anything that's kind of seen as progressive and not conforming to some ideals of a more conservative uh, society. So it's kind of in that very fraught political space that we got together and all the contributors to this book are early career scholars who either work in the Eastern European region or are from the Eastern European region or might have moved out of the region, but still define uh, themselves research wise as uh, connected to Eastern Europe in some way. Um, and we were both trying to canvas the state of environmentalism in Eastern Europe on its own terms, but also looking at the ways in which uh, Western environmentalism has been accommodated and adapted um, uh, through a number of case studies. And we look at climate change policy, we look at conservation, um, we look at the development of NGOs and civil society uh, actors. So there is an awful, a lot of variety in the book, which is why I um, can really recommend it still. Um, and in terms of, you can move on to the next slide now. Sorry, Tom. In terms of kind of getting to why we decided to go open access, it was kind of, Almost there was no question actually when we decided that it made sense for us to publish all together because we felt that open access was the only form of publishing that also reflected our politics um, in terms of the way that we were very um, grounded and tried to remain engaged with the communities in which we were working in. Um, there are obviously very practical considerations too here, um, mainly around the fact that a lot of uh, governments in the region and universities can't afford um, access to, to research that is published behind a paywall. Um, and so publishing open access kind of ensured that we would reach the people we really wanted to read this stuff. Um, I also think, and related to some of the points that David was making earlier in terms of the terms of the conversations around uh, environmental and climate justice, in some ways, I think that the, the uh, inability of many people to access research has become a problem for public policy related to the environment. Um, and the reason this is, is because people don't understand what is behind a lot of the research, what it seeks to achieve. And there isn't an open conversation around the consequences and the differential effects of some public policies. Um, and there is thus a lot of resistance to, to interventions that are seen to be against um, the way that people are living their lives. Um, and that is certainly true, I think, in a lot of areas that are seen as increasingly reactionary or populist. Um, and we wanted this conversation um, around the politics of environmental policy uh, to be as open as possible. So that was definitely the reason we went open access. And then just the third and final slide. Um, 
kind of tries to get to why we went open book um, specifically. Um, and that had to do largely with the fact that it came as very a very, very highly recommended publisher. We had a great time in terms of um, the editing and um, rigor of review. And we were really kind of confident that the end result would be um, respected and valued both by the academic community um, as well as the wider audience that it could reach. Um, and it was very important to us because no matter whether you're publishing um, with a main publishing house or whether you're going for an open access book, it's the same amount of work that goes into it. Um, so that was really what motivated us uh, to go with OBP uh, specifically. So thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And um, great way to end on open book publishers as we will move to our third panelist here, Lucy Barnes, who is the editor and outreach coordinator for uh, open book publishers. Lucy. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and thanks, Esther, as well, for those kind words. Um, I did not ask Esther to say those things. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to hear them. And we're really glad um, that you had such a good experience. Um, so, as Tom says, my name is Lucy Barnes and I'm one of the coordinators of the Open Access uh, Books Network, um, as well as being an editor and an outreach coordinator at Open Book Publishers. So I'm going to talk a little bit from the Open Access Press perspective um, and sort of address the topic from that angle. Um, so OBP is a, a scholar-led, born Open Access Press, which means that we've always published Open Access books since we were founded um, in 2008. Um, we were founded by the, the group of academics that you can see there in that slide. Um, we're a not-for-profit press, and ever since we were founded, the aim of the press has been to make high-quality um, academic books freely um, and easily accessible all around the world. Um, and this has obvious benefits um, for research on, on climate and the environment, which our two speakers um, have already spoken of have, have covered. Um, but I think the thing that's particularly interesting about ODP is that we are a small press, um, but I think we have a very outsized impact precisely because our books are open access. Um, so all of our books are published open access and we publish about 40 books a year. Um, up to date, we've published um, over 260 books. They're all um, rigorously peer reviewed and they are accessed worldwide around 20,000 times um, a month. And that's the key thing I think for us in terms of the impact that these books can have. Um, and particularly when you're thinking about an urgent topic like um, climate and the environment and also a topic where you know there is a kind of an urgency to get information out there rapidly now you know particularly given that we all I think appreciate that we're reaching a kind of crisis stage with this and as David was saying actually have been in a crisis stage for longer than we may have been willing to to kind of admit it. Um, so this is a selection of the books that we published in the last kind of two two and a half years um, on topics related to climate and the environment um, and the average uh, academic book, closed access academic book, will sell around 200 copies in its lifetime. So today I went and had a look at the, the figures for these books in terms of access and downloads. Um, and so the, I've sort of broadly listed the books in order of publication. So top left, uh, you can see in politics is the most recent um, and actually the environment in the age of the internet is the, the oldest on here. So you can see that the numbers grow over time uh, as you'd expect. Um, and of course, you know, they're large compared to that, that sales figure. Um, and when you talk about usage, you know, I'm always sort of cautious to say, you, you know, these figures are quite uh, blunt in some respects. You know, they don't measure the quality of the engagement. So somebody may have downloaded a book, saved it on their computer to read and never got around to it. Somebody might have really taken it to pieces and delved into it and used it in their own work. Um, they may have just rifled through it for a fact or a name. Um, but the point is that all of these different types of engagement, however shallow or deep, the, the sort of p potential for them is greatly um, increased when you publish a book, open access. Um, and then, you know, the potential impact that, that the work can have is therefore, um, you know, likewise larger. Um, and I think particularly, you know, topics such as this one, um, as Esther was saying, you know, you may want to reach policymakers, um, you may want to reach educators, you may want to reach the sort of people that wouldn't necessarily automatically have access to an academic library where many of the copies of a closed access academic book would be available. Um, so I think the other thing to emphasize is location. 
um, as well as frequency. And I think David and Esther both picked up on this as well. Um, it's not just that you want these books to be read widely, but that it may be that there are specific audiences that you want a book to reach and that via open access, it may be um, more able um, to be read. So this is one example that was on the previous slide. Um, it's been accessed over 40,000 times now since it was published in late 2019. Um, and usually for our books, you know, we're an English language press, we're based in the UK. You tend to find that um, the top two countries that are accessing most of our books will be the US and the UK. Um, but for this book, I don't know if you can see there, the, the top 10 countries, the US is the top, but then you have uh, Philippines, South Africa, India, and then the UK sort of behind. Um, Nigeria is there as well. Um, and when you look at the continental usage as well, you see Asia is top, then North America, then Africa. Um, and the authors of this book, they deliberately wanted it to be published open access because they wanted um, it to be able to be accessed easily in the sub-Saharan African region. And they knew that closed access publication the logistics and the cost of getting the books out there would mean that its impact was much less. And, you know, they've, they've heard a lot from people who are using the book um, in that region. And as a result of the success of this edition, they've got the funding to produce a francophone edition, which will also be publishing, um, which will reach people beyond the kind of obviously the, the English language. Um, so I think this is a really important aspect of, of open access um, publishing for this topic as well. And I think the, the other thing that I really wanted to mention is just this, this point about uh, publishing is obviously a, a two-sided thing. So you've got people who read the books, but you also obviously need to be able to publish them. And I think the danger of open access, and particularly the sort of more dominant fee-based models for open access, is that you'll end up in a situation where, yes, the work is freely available to read, and that's a great thing, but is it possible for people all over the world to publish open access? And I think for, particularly for a topic like um, climate and the environment, you know, some of the severest impacts of climate change will be felt most immediately by, uh, in many cases, people in poorer regions of the world. And I think if you're sort of saying to, to people in those parts of the world that they may be shut out from publishing open access because of the sorts of models that we're using, you know, that's not kind of, it's not something that we should be supporting. It should be, we should be looking for, for ways to, to avoid that. Um, so there are a number of different ways of publishing um, open access books and, and of funding that publication. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of them now, although I can talk about this more um, in the questions that people would like. Um, but obviously you do have the kind of fee-based model, which has the benefit, at least for presses, of being simple. Um, but it also is inequitable because obviously not everybody can afford a fee. Not everybody has access to a funder who can afford a fee. Um, and as a result, it's also um, quite unpopular. And that fee obviously can range... Uh, in size as well. So sometimes you can be paying up to £12,000 to publish a single book. But there are other ways of, of funding open access publication. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, open book publishers and how we do it. So we don't charge authors to publish with us. Um, and this is the way that we fund um, what we do instead. Um, so you'll see the largest chunk there in terms of income is uh, sales revenue. And uh, I think that's worth emphasizing, I always emphasize this whenever I talk about uh, how we fund what we do, because I think there's often a perception that open access means no sales, and that's just simply not true in our experience. Um, it's it's our largest income stream, and I think it, I'm right in saying that it always has been, um, or at least, you know, in the time that I've been at the press since 2016, it, it, it definitely has been. Um, then the second largest chunk there is grants and donations. So we ask if authors can access funding that they um, apply for it. Um, but if they can't, then that's totally fine. You know, we don't make that a condition of publication. If a book passes peer review, we'll publish the book, uh, whether or not there's any funding attached. Um, and then the last uh, chunk there that I want to talk about, that green chunk, is our library membership programme. Um, and I think this is something that's worth considering, again, in, in the light of the, the topic that we're discussing today. Um, you know, I think it's sort of slowly being acknowledged that climate and the environment is an issue obviously that affects the whole world and that to, to tackle it effectively we're going to need some kind of collective approach or, or collective approaches you know it's it's not the case that one country or one group is going to be able to solve these problems um and i think collective funding for open access books is a similar approach to the problem of how do you fund open access to research for the world 
Um, so at OBP, we have over 240 library members now, and they all pay an annual fee, which depends on the size of their institution. Um, and that helps to fund our work. And they get some benefits in exchange for that. So they get access to some digital editions that we would otherwise charge for. They get discounts on paper copies. But those benefits are, are relatively minor. Uh, you know, we're happy to offer them. But the main reason that libraries support us is because they want to support what we do. And they believe in the idea of building a, you know, a kind of global, um, openly accessible collection of research for the world. And collector funding, you know, it's more equitable from the perspective of publishing from the author perspective, because we're not asking one individual or one institution to pay a, a disproportionate cost. But it's also good from the perspective of the publisher, because it's a more stable source of income for us. So, you know, if we lose three or four libraries in a year, that's fine. We're not going to be sort of hold below the waterline. We can we can weather that. And there are, as a result, there are a number of different um, programs like this that are coming out now. Um, you know, I think we were one of the earlier publishers to to develop one we started ours in 2015 but now you see MIT have got one uh, University of Michigan Press have got one at the Copen project where I work there are a couple of different models um, so I think you know again I can talk a bit more about those in the questions if people would like but this is a, a solution to the question of how do we fund open access books which is you know really worth exploring and supporting um, I'm going to skip through those because I don't have time um, so this last point was one that I wanted to, to finish on um, you know, climate change obviously is not just about hard science. Um, there are many different aspects to the problem of climate change. It has impacts on people, migration patterns, food sustainability, politics, protest, culture, and many, many more of these. Um, you know, and all of these topics tend to fall within the remit of the arts, humanities, and social sciences, um, and tend to be explored in the main in book form. Um, you know, this kind of long, sustained and, and complex engagement with a, with a particular topic. And I think, you know, open access for books has tended to be overlooked in favour of journals and has tended to be a focus on the journal article and that this is somehow the most important or meaningful way to share academic work. Um, but I think it's important that books are not overlooked and that, um, you know, we sort of emphasise the value of, of open access to book length research specifically. Um, and I think there's also a value there for the subjects themselves, because certainly in the UK and I think possibly in other countries in the world, you're seeing um, arts, humanities and social science subjects often uh, devalued or undermined or talked about as though they're somehow not as valuable as um, science subjects, you know, the STEM subjects. And I think the level of usage that you get from open access and the different types of usage that are potentially enabled but when, when a work is available open access, Kind of is, is quite a strong counter argument to that and says you know what the, the research in this in these subjects is very important um, and it can have a big a big impact um, on the world and I think that's something that you know we sort of need to be making the argument for more strongly um, and more powerfully um, so hopefully that wasn't too much to kind of try and skate through uh, in the time and I'd be happy to take uh, questions afterwards thank you for listening Thanks very much, Lucy, and thanks for sharing a bit more uh, on this topic from a publisher perspective. And I think also to show that we should make sure that while uh, lowering barriers to readers, we should make sure not to raise new ones for authors and try to avoid those fees and uh, figure out a better collective way to ensure we can continue to publish the open access. Um, then I'd like to hand over to our fourth panelist, Melissa. Um, please uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to join you. And um, I'll start by giving some background on the Open Climate Campaign, um, as well as sharing our goals and the work that the campaign is doing around climate justice specifically, given the, given the theme of Open Access Week, and then how researchers themselves can really support the mission in the campaign. So I'll just start with a very basic concept. Oh, hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, with a very basic concept that currently the open sharing of research outputs is not the norm. 
And if we look across disciplines and across countries, it's anywhere between 35 and 40% of research is now being shared and published as open access. But um, during the pandemic, we saw something very different happen. And there was a real recognition that during the pandemic that this was a really different time and that all things that we know that are helpful to accelerate research must be employed. And so we saw chief science advisors in many countries really call out to governments and publishers to make research on COVID openly available. And we can see that that really produced um, a, a huge outpouring of support in that um, roughly 77% of research on COVID um, is published um, in open access. And of course, that's a stark difference from open access across um, all fields. So given this recognition that um, when we are facing global challenges, we need to really unleash the full potential of science. And it was in the middle of the pandemic um, in early um, 2021, that Francis Pinter, who some of you may know, um, and I started to have a series of discussions about possibly using the model that was working for COVID research and applying that to research around climate change. So um, we uh, formed a coalition um, and um, we came to it with the desire because we knew that um, uh, when we are facing the world's greatest challenges that we need to employ um, all of the tools that we have. And there is no greater challenge facing humanity than climate change. So we built the coalition with Eiffel, and I know Irina is on the call right now, who's leading our work there, um, with Eiffel and Spark and Creative Commons, um, Peter Suber and the Arcadia Fund. So with seed funding from the Open Society Foundations and four million from Arcadia, um, we launched the project in um, August of this year. And um, the project itself has 11 goals. Um, the overarching goal is to make open the default in publishing for research on climate science and biodiversity. So um, the, the campaign, um, our first goal that um, we are using to um, uh, work towards our, our, our main goal is to develop messaging to target all of the stakeholders and within um, the, the field. And really reaching out to um, researchers is one of our main um, ambitions and um, really with the message that it's important to make all of the research published open. Um, and I'll dig in to that deeper and share more on what researchers can do to share it and to share and support the campaign. Um, we also want to um, figure out how much research is currently being published as open access in these fields. Um, and um, as David and Lucy um, mentioned, really um, defining what research around climate change is, is difficult because climate change is touching so many parts of our lives and crosses so many different disciplines. So we're working with the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative out of Australia um, on this research. And also their work will be able to point us to who the main funders of the research are. So we'll be able to better target our advocacy efforts. Um, we are beginning to um, identify the legal and policy barriers to the to development of policies, um, specifically at the national and uh, institutional level. And our goals um, four, five, and six really um, uh, focus on um, the development of open policies with the funders and governments and environmental organizations who are supporting this research. So once we've identified the legal and policy barriers, um, and of course we you know many of them um, from the work that we've done on the development of policies over the years, but then we'll be able to better support um, the funders um, to actually help them develop their own policies. And um, we are working to include open language into international frameworks, specifically those um, under the auspices of the UN, such as the convention 
on biological diversity. Now, um, our eighth goal is um, really um, uh, what we're doing now to really raise awareness of the campaign and talk about it and hopefully raise support for it. Um, and uh, our next goal um, really touches upon um, the issue of climate justice. For just as COVID has really touched everyone, um, we're seeing something similar with climate change. However, it's really not affecting everyone equally. Um, and on this goal, um, we'll be collaborating with traditionally excluded voices. As many decisions on open access have traditionally been, been made or been driven by those in the global north, by many innovations um, have taken place in the global south, um, notably Latin America. And as Lucy was just pointing out, um, Many now in the global north rely on the article processing fee, um, yet many in Latin America have found other revenue generating models to support their work. Um, and Cielo is a great example of that. So we, we really want to make sure that innovations that happen throughout the world are really taken into, um, into the larger discussions of the movement. And um, our 10th and 11th goals, our um, secondary goals at this time, and we'll be identifying foundational research um, within the field and advocating for it to be made open. Um, so here really reaching out to authors um, and encouraging them to um, deposit their works in repositories. And um, goal number 11, so really on the heels of the push to make research around COVID and then around monkeypox open, um, we'll be calling and advocating with publishers um, for a special public interest priority to be given to research on climate science and biodiversity. So a bit more on our work around climate justice. Um, we'll be working with um, traditionally excluded voices and um, really working to identify and convene leaders um, in underrepresented geographical regions, as well as identifying climate and biodiversity topics um, and challenges that are specific to these areas. And then working with these groups um, to ensure that the campaign not only includes, but also prioritizes and privileges um, working with these partners. So in terms of what researchers can do to support the campaign, um, uh, to deposit their preprints and postprints into respective repositories. Um, of course, publishing the work is open access, um, depositing data and scientific code and scripts and models um, in repositories. Um, the campaign has recently launched a newsletter and we invite everyone um, to sign up for that. It's a great way to stay informed and abreast of developments with the campaign. And importantly, um, to really share information about the campaign with your peers and colleagues. Um, and if anyone has contacts with um, funders who are supporting research in these areas, um, to share them with the campaign because those personal connections are really helpful for advocacy efforts. Now we've developed a researcher action kit, which is currently available in English, French, and Spanish on the website. We also have other action kits um, targeting other stakeholders within, um, within the campaign as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melissa, for the introduction to the Open Climate Campaign and to see what has already been done in uh, the months since it's launched, since it's launched and yeah, much more that is uh, to come still, I'm sure. Um, with that, we've come to an end of the panel part, and we have uh, 15 minutes for questions, comments, or thoughts, if anyone would like to um, to ask these to our panelists. Feel free to use the chat or to simply unmute yourself uh, if you would like. So give it a minute if anyone... Um, see, David, have you just raise your hand, I see. Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, to Esther, have you had any engagements from policymakers in Eastern Europe, any responses that are encouraging in relation to the goals you had in mind? Yes, <clears throat> actually not so much from policymakers, no, but certainly um, from universities. 
in terms of them making either spaces available for these sorts of conversations at the local community level. Um, and certainly within Hungary, we've had some engagement from more local institutions. So you can say that they're policymakers, but they're more working within councils or within national parks. Um, but unfortunately, not so much engagement with higher up. But in some ways, that was kind of our goal as well. Um, we were realistic in terms of not thinking that we would get um, nation state level uh, change or even public dialogue happening. Um, but it's certainly a conversation that's uh, starting at the local scale. Um, yeah, we found that, I mean, all, all the countries are very different in terms of their political contexts. Um, the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia have been more open, I would say, than, than places like Hungary and Poland today. That's a great question. I have one time if I can. Um, so again, Esther and David, I was wondering, because I think you both mentioned that uh, some of the things that you have to say in your books aren't necessarily uh, going to be received well or might be controversial um, to some audiences. So I wondered if you'd had any kind of pushback or negative responses from anybody who were upset or riled by anything that you said. Esther, please go first. <clears throat> in some ways, most of the pushback that we experience as researchers who work a lot in rural places um, is against a lot of the policy that we see coming out of the European Union. Um, so in terms of... Um, pressure from farmers in terms of pushing back around commitments that they have to make around land use changes. Um, that is a big source, I would say, of a lot of anti-EU rhetoric that we're seeing uh, in rural areas, because then we're having national governments say that they're trying to protect their local citizens against unfair demands from the international uh, scale. Um, but in terms of whether we received pushback in terms of documenting these things, yes, actually, that's one of the key challenges, I would say, as researchers who really try to understand the kernels for populism. Um, there is some danger of them being accused of being overly sympathetic by trying to uh, better understand their narratives and their reasons for opposition to some of these uh, climate change related policies. Um, and land use related policies. And that's a really fine line. And I think it's a, an anthropological conundrum in many ways in terms of how to um, almost dialogue between different communities that don't actually have a space to speak to one another. Um, so in some ways, I would say that this publication and then the feedback that we were able to give in terms of translating our chapter into local language was, was something that we that several of the authors prioritized and one of the benefits of publishing open access to in terms of the Creative Commons license enabled us to do that. Um, and in some ways, I would say then that even though there is a bit of anger and pushback in terms of us being seen by both sides as justifying something that is unjustifiable because it's seen as an imposition is actually a really important um, moment, I think, to make that space for people to be able to air why they are resistant to uh, these environmental ideas and pathways. And a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that these uh, policies around environment and climate are not done in an inclusive and democratic way. They are kind of very reactive, very fast paced. People don't have the time to respond to them. Um, and a lot of the people that are kind of on the front line having to accommodate and make these changes um, are working the land and it's their immediate livelihoods uh, that are affected. So um, in that sense, I think that, yeah, this book is in a very, very particular and interesting space. And I'm not saying that we've resolved those conundrums, but I think at least we're having that conversation. That's all fascinating. I'm learning so much today. This is fabulous. In response to your question, the biggest pushback I've received, um, Lucy, has been in response to the chapter, don't bear children or bear no children. Um, I have close friends and colleagues and relatives and many others who've 
um, spoken to me or written to me or protested loudly against that element in the argument. Um, the statistical argument that I present in the chapter is overwhelming. Um, the carbon footprint of bearing one child vastly exceeds the good we could do through reducing electricity consumption, recycling, etc. The usual list of things we can do it's vastly exceeds it by a multiple of 10, perhaps, or 20, I forget. Um, so the case is very clear, but people just do not want to um, accept that. So I found, I found that that is, ironically, even though I touch on so many other themes in the book, that that's the biggest suggestion I make in the book um, that um, to which people react with a certain degree of hostility. Yeah. Um, and of course, I engage them very politely and sometimes in a long conversation. Um, and it's fascinating um, because it's clear that personal emotional needs outweigh the concerns we have in the climate research uh, domain. Um, so it speaks, obviously, we have policy questions. We have many other areas, but the personal emotional worlds of people is another dimension of this discussion. Uh, thank you. I see we've received a, a question from the chat from Emma. Um, if you'd like, you could ask the question yourself, Emma, or if you want, like, be happy to read it from the chat here. Um, hi. Uh, so I'm not an academic or researcher. I'm actually I'm a librarian in the UK at the University of Manchester, um, and I'm really interested in open access and um, discoverability of open access outputs. But I was wondering, from the researcher perspective, um, if there's still a perception by some people that publishing as open access is still seen as sort of self-publishing and therefore it's not been robustly peer reviewed. Um, or have we won that battle? Because I would hate to think that open access research is dismissed or ignored because some people perceive open access publishing as not um, robust in the same way that paid to read uh, publications are. I'm happy to answer first. Um, that's a great question. Um, I have to say that I was my this idea for the edited volume that we kind of embarked on um we probably started it around six years ago so it took quite a while from start to finish and I was then not in a permanent academic post and with some of the job applications that I put in that was actually something that kept cropping up in interviews that universities so here I'm thinking about the people who were on the interview selection committees actively discouraged me from publishing open access and so it wasn't a question of them thinking that it was self-publishing it was more against the prestige of or the perceived prestige um, of accepted publishing houses or venerated publishing houses uh, there was a preference for for that form um, and so that's why I think that um, campaigns like um, um, who, like that Melissa introduced are so important because I think that there is actually a culture within the university that needs to change as well um, from higher up uh, that needs to feed into the merits of and, and the realities of open access publishing. Um, I think that that's actually changing in time as the UK is quite progressive, I think, in terms of now requiring um, all publications to be open access if they're funded by um, taxpayer money. And I think in that sense, we are slowly changing. Um, but yes, even five years ago, it was discouraged from within universities. And I would answer a slightly different way since I was a full professor and quite senior in my institution. So it's a very slight effect on me. Um, but it turns out that those who publish at prestigious presses are the ones who get the named chairs, who get the kind of accolade from the institution, whereas the fact I published open access meant that I, I was not going to be honored in that way. This doesn't matter to me, but it is a signal that at least a few years ago, there was a similar bias, even within um, the way institutions look at what established scholars are doing. But I do think that's changing, just as Esther suggested. The fact that in the EU there is a move to require it, I think it shows that there is a cultural sea change. Plus, post-COVID, it's going to become far more uh, respected. So 
Um, maybe what Esther and I have experienced is a bit dated. I think the future, in the future, I think we'll see much more positive attitude. Could I come in as well? I think that um, the issue of academic evaluation is, some that, is something that we're still doing a lot of work around. Um, and um, in the US now, we have something called the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Science. Helios, um, that's trying to really work with universities um, to um, uh, explore more the um, value of open access and get universities to really appreciate that and the um, promotion and tenure process. Um, but there is still work to be done. Um, but just as Esther said, with the EU mandate around open access, we're having something similar here in the US. Um, the end of August, the Biden administration um, mandated that all research, federally, all federally funded research will be made openly available um, by the end of 2025. Um, so that's going to have, um, that's going to have a huge impact as well in the space. That's great to hear. I'm, I'm glad that we are seeing that, that change in perspective now and that it's being led by mandates, uh, by funders and governments, but also just by um, virtue of what happened in the during the pandemic, people are realizing the value of open access and, and that that's the way to go. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, David, I see you've unmuted. you unmuted. There is still a minute if you would like to add something still. <laughs> I just wanted to alert Lucy and Melissa that I have questions for them. We may not have time for me to ask them now, but I will be emailing them uh, somewhat when I get the chance because I want to follow up with you with some fascinating presentations. And I just want to shout out and give you thanks for everything you taught me today. Great. That's very, very good to hear. And um, yeah, maybe on that note, I can close off uh, as we have one more minute. Um, and certainly this could be the beginning and not the ending of uh, a conversation um, that we can all have. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, very much thank our panelists for joining us today and for sharing more about the work that they do. And I think more importantly, for initiating and engaging in conversations that may not be easy, uh, but that we certainly need to have, whether it's around climate or around opening up uh, research, very vital research to address uh, a rather urgent and very complex challenge that we face globally. And um, thanks very much for everyone who joined us as well. And um, as mentioned, please uh, continue the conversation, take a look at uh, the books uh, from book publishers, and especially the Open Climate Campaign as well, which uh, is, of course, uh, very central in this week, but also in the weeks, months, and years uh, to come as they continue with their work. So thanks everyone, and please feel free to follow up afterwards uh, via email, in person, online, or wherever we may uh, encounter one another. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Tom.